Disappointment is terrible, isn't it? Hopes dashed, dreams that you realise it's never going to come true. Perhaps it's at, at work that uh, a position, a responsibility that you just assumed that eventually it would come to you and it dawns on you gradually it's never going to come. Perhaps it's in the area of romance and you realise that that marriage that you always dreamed of, actually it's not going to happen or, or it does happen and it's not what you hope for. And then there's a disappointment that we feel, not from stuff around us, but from stuff inside us, when we take stock and we realize, I'm just not the person I ought to be. I, I hoped I would be. I am far more angry, far more grumpy with my children than I ever realized I could be. There is just not the joy and the excitement about life in, my, in me that I thought that there should be, that I feel that there would be, it all feels a bit wooden. I don't know whether you can identify with any of those things. Disappointment. And behind the feelings of disappointment, there can lie a deeper disappointment. Not always put into words, but disappointment with God. Because we may not ever put it into words, but we're thinking, where is God in this? Why isn't he answering my prayers? Why are the things that I've longed for and prayed for so often not in my life? God, are you not listening? Do you not care? We start to think. It is really striking that that same note of disappointment is right here at the heart of Isaiah 49. It didn't come out in the way it was read, uh, the way the sound worked, but uh, the the transition between verse 13 and 14, I think, stands out. You have a note of joy, and then suddenly, verse 14, a sour note as Zion, Jerusalem, uh, standing for the people of God, says, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Sounds so out of place in the middle of such promise and such hope. And yet, isn't that your experience of life? It's mine. How come people are feeling like that? What are they missing, these people back then? What are they not seeing? And how might seeing those things for them be the sort of thing that you need to see and I need to see if we're going to make sense of our experience of disappointment in life. You see, it all has to do with the person, I don't know whether you picked it up in the video, the person called the servant in this part of Isaiah, not in a Downton Abbey, down on your hands and knees, scrubbing the floor kind of servant, not that kind, more the, um, the person who's the servant, if you imagine um, someone who's the kind of called a loyal servant of one of these huge companies that everyone respects the company and they're a loyal servant of that company. And this is the chief servant of the kingdom of heaven. Chief servant, or as we call it, prime minister of the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to focus on him. Okay? We're going to see what does he do. Uh, Sorry, who is he first? What does he do? And then what does that cost him? Verses 1 and 2. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me, and from my mother's womb he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. Who is this servant? There are two themes there interwoven. One is the fact that he's hidden. And the second is the fact that he speaks. The servant of God says, in the shadow of his hand, he hid me. And again in verse 2, he he concealed me in his quiver. There's something hard to understand about this servant. Something difficult to get about him. Something obscure that you, you struggle to get hold of. 
At the same time, though, he speaks and it has tremendous power. The images of his mouth, his words, being like a sharpened sword, it's a battle image, it's vivid. What does that mean? It means somehow that his words cut into us, they get to the heart of us, that his words lay bare what would otherwise be hidden. They are capable of exposing us and what's really going on. Verse 2 adds to that picture. He made me into a polished arrow. The idea is the one that will fly true and hit its target. So this servant is a strange mix. He's hidden, he's hard to spot, and yet his word hits its target and penetrates powerfully at work in the world. Verse 3, we learn the servant's name. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I display my splendor. And immediately we scratch our heads and think, hang on a minute, there's a bit of a puzzle there. I thought, I thought Israel was a whole nation of people. And there's just one person being called Israel. But if you look down to verse 6 and you see there that the servant's job is to bring back Israel to God... And you start to see the clue that's in Isaiah 49 that this individual is Israel in a way that Israel never was. We've had 48 chapters uh, talking about Israel's failure and you saw it with the Lego characters, the way that there was going to be battles, they were going to lose, they were going to be carried away into exile because the nation had not been the servant they should have been. Uh, in the world for God but finally is going to come an individual who is the true Israel the the real servant of God and be all that God's people fail to be in their nation's history and be that for the sake of the world that's who we're talking about when we're looking at this figure of a servant Earlier on in Isaiah, uh, God's used this picture of his people as like vines planted in his vineyard, planted in the best soil and tended, given every opportunity to grow, lovingly cared for, protected by God himself, the gardener. And when he looks for a good crop of grapes, chapter 5, verse 2, it yielded only bad fruit. Fast forward. 700 odd years, John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Do you see what he's saying there of himself? I, individual, am the true Israel, the true vine. Everything that Israel failed to be and failed to do Jesus, the individual, fulfillment of it all, is going to do. He's the servant of God that Isaiah prophesied not knowing his name. But we, 2,000 years later, do. God sent someone who would get it right and did get it right. We can read about his life in the New Testament and, and accomplish in the place of the nation all that they should have accomplished. Jesus, who isn't immediately obvious to everyone. There's some things about him that are hard to grasp, aren't there? But Jesus, who speaks the very words of God, that hit the target, that speak to our souls, penetrating right to the heart of who we are. So let's look more about Isaiah's vision and this vision of, of who the servant is. We've seen that, this, this individual who would fulfill all, the, all of God's uh, promises uh, but what's he come to do? Verses 5 and 6 give us this glorious vision of his mission. That God's mission, that the servant's mission that he's given will be to bring back uh, Jacob and to gather Israel. But, verse 6, that's too small a thing, says God, for him to do just that. Just, just the nation of Israel, just Jacob. I've got to think of something bigger. What, 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 what else could he do? Ah, got it. Verse 6, I'll make you a light for the nations, for all people. I'll do it so my salvation will reach the ends of the earth. Yeah, that would be big enough for this servant to do, wouldn't it? That vision, that mission. And sometimes uh, if, we're, if we're in a season of discouragement or we've just 
had something that's really got us down, those, those feelings actually can lift like a ray of light shining in if something big happens which is good. You actually see it in the world um, all the time with sports people. Um, you know, a, a footballer maybe who's um, just going through a run of bad form, uh, letting in goals or um, not scoring. And the commentators will not stop going out on about it. Every time the, play, t- the team plays, it's, oh, you know, oh, bad form. And they're just going down on this person and making their disappointment even deeper. And then the national team plays and the list of the selection goes out and the national team manager puts this player on the list. They've still got confidence in them. And you see that player lift and play the game of their life and score a hat trick or save every shot that's fired at them because something's happened and someone continues to have faith in them. Well, what about you and me? What about us when we're disappointed in life and with life, when we're disillusioned about the way that things are turning out? What what could we hear that would be like that, that would be like light coming through into our lives and giving us something to put our faith in and hold on to? Well, would being caught up in the restoration of the whole world, in fact the whole universe, being included by God in his plan to bring everything back together into this perfect place, this perfect city we had pictured in the video, would being part of that do something to lift our spirits? I am the vine, said Jesus. You are the branches. Doesn't it help to see our disappointments differently when we realise that through Jesus, God is saving people from all nations, including this nation, including you and me, as we put our faith in him. That actually we now belong to him and we're caught up in this great work, this great people that he is calling together. Isn't that a perspective that makes a difference? Now, I'm going to apply that, or we're going to apply that, see how it applies in a moment. But just something to point out along the way here. Because sometimes you hear Christians who get very, very focused on the the nation of Israel, the the biological descendants of of Abraham. And they're forever looking for clues about what, you know, looking for the news and websites and what's happening in the world uh, based on what's happening in Israel and trying to guess from those kind of clues about what God's doing in the world today. You see, though, in Isaiah 49, 2,700 years ago, you see there God's plan for Israel After 48 chapters where the nation, it's clear that they're never going to get it right. You see that God fulfills all the hopes and dreams of the nation in this servant, in Jesus as he comes. And after centuries of disappointment, we hear the prophecy of the one who is the true Israel, who is the true vine, who will restore both Jacob and Israel, the tribes, and at the same time, be a light to the nations. Even if you look at verse 1, the islands, far away places like Britain, from an Israel perspective, oh goodness me, the ends of the earth. <laughs> yeah? And do you see what that means for God's purposes in the world? It's not about biology anymore. It, Jesus is the Israel that everything has been pointing to. He's the true vine. All who put their faith in him are included, both Jews and Gentiles. And it means that you and I, we're part of the true Israel through Jesus. That is massive. That is a huge privilege for that to be our identity, part of God's true people through Jesus Christ. So, focusing that, focusing on that big picture of the servant, it will speak, it will be light that shines into 
our disappointments. But, but because we're focusing big, that doesn't mean that God doesn't care about the detail. It doesn't mean that God's saying, you know, just, yeah, yeah okay, when you go through hard times, just, I haven't really got a plan for those, but just, you know, focus on the big picture. No, actually, when we, when we see how much it costs the servant and the way that Isaiah speaks about how God does the restoration, it is big picture, but it's also about the personal stuff. It's about the details of our lives. So if you were to look at verse 4 with me, uh, it's such a frustration not being able to... We're not clever enough, sadly, to put it up on the screen for you. And so this is why, again, I'm encouraging you, uh, have, a, have a phone or a, or a, a tablet or an or a old-school book Bible. Uh, but if you, uh, let me read verse 4. It's another striking verse. It's the servant speaking this time. And he says, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. He sounds enormously discouraged. The servant, this one who's chosen by God, who's known by God from his mother's womb. Glance down to verse 7 where God is speaking and he describes the servant as one who is despised and abhorred. Isn't that extraordinary? This servant of such power knows very personally, very deeply what it is to experience disappointment, rejection, frustration, the feelings of futility that we know so well, that is what it cost to save us. Isn't that what Jesus did? He entered right into the depths of human experience, the depths of human despair. He carried our disappointments, our burdens, our sins. Verse 14 is spoken by people who felt forsaken and when Jesus died on the cross remember his words he said it in Aramaic Eloi Eloi lama sabachthani my God my God why have you forsaken me because he was forsaken as he took on sin and took on the punishment for sin in our place Jesus was abandoned and forsaken by God so that you and I need never be that is the wonder of this servant, this great one, and how he does his work to save the world. Now, the results of it are summarized in verses 7 to 13. I'm just going to gloss over it, really. It's a wonderful picture of how God provides for all his uh, people in, in the details of life. There's a picture there of pasture, so we don't hunger, of protection from the desert heat, of guidance to springs of living water. God is concerned about the details of our lives. The climax is verse 13, when all of creation joins a song of praise. And then the next verse is where verse 14 sounds. It's Zion saying, God's forgotten me, God's forsaken me. But isn't that true to life, isn't it? When others around us are really rejoicing, things are going well for other people, that our disappointments get, oh, they're the deepest, they're the heaviest to carry because, oh, what about me? It's a song of joy with a sour note. But uh, ask a jazz musician, apparently, if you get a, a flat in a piece of jazz, a, an off note, apparently the note that really matters is the next one. And so after Zion sounds verse 14, the Lord has forgotten me, look at the next one, verse 15. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Mothers in the room, a uh, quick survey. Hands up, anyone in the room who, um, after giving birth um, uh, and uh, being discharged from the maternity ward, uh, you got home and you thought, oh, bother, I've forgotten something. Oh, I know, I know, I know there was some, oh, I've forgotten the baby. A a anyone, anyone volunteering to have done that? I mean, it's just like, huh? No mother would do that. That's the logic here, isn't it? 
And you see what it says? Even if a mother could do that, God says, I will never forget you. What a, what a word to receive from the living God about his tender care for you and for me. Uh, look at the next verse. See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands. That's what Jesus says. Do you remember what Jesus did after the resurrection? He appeared to his disciples and he said, look at my hands and my feet. Look at the nail marks all the way through. See how I have loved you. Look at your name, not so much engraved on my hands, but pierced all the way through for your salvation. That's what Jesus Christ says to you and me. Can a mother forget? No way. Will God? No way. How much are you loved? How much are you known by God? Well, it's all the way through his love for you. You see, we bring to God our disappointments, our doubts, our sin. Rightly so that we bring them to God. And he meets them with his own body broken, with his own blood shed. He meets them with his grace. He meets them with his generosity and love poured out. It really is an extraordinary thing, the Christian faith. So shall we take a moment now just to pray? I'll lead us in stages. Let's pray first of all to thank him for what he has done in history, but not just back in history, it's in history for the world forever through Jesus. And perhaps talk to him about how you're feeling at the moment. About what you're facing at the moment. And if disappointment is a word that rings true, talk to him about those things. finally hear his word of consolation can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born though she may forget I will not forget you see I have engraved you on the palms of my hand amen